Hey there. Either my YouTube title or the thumbnail impressed you a lot. So you ended up watching my video. Thanks for watching my video. So as a data scientist or an ML engineer, why should I have to learn Spark-like component and that too in big data? So in this video, I am going to explain all the concepts and the answers for the question that you have in your mind in an interesting and fun way. So please do watch this video till and and definitely you will like this video and please do subscribe my channel. Let's get into the topic. So Spark is one of the leading data processing framework in big data. So you may ask me like, why should I have to learn this? Or just try to convince me like, why should I have to learn this Spark as an ML or a data scientist? Okay. So if you go for data scientist interviews or an ML interviews in the company, right? Nowadays, how they're asking question for a data scientist and ML, you know? They're asking data engineer topics. They're especially asking this big data, NoSQL, have you worked in any distributed file system? All these are data engineering question, which they are asking to a data scientist and an ML engineer, right? And also Spark supports the machine learning libraries. Spark enables the machine learning engineers and the data scientists to work with machine learning stuff. So Spark has a concept called MLib. It has a component called MLib. We call it as a machine learning libraries, which enables you to make use of Spark to run or deploy your machine learning models. But you know, you may ask a question. So as a data engineer, do you get this machine learning or data scientist question in an interview? No, as a data engineer, we never used to get such questions. But as a data engineer, we are getting software engineering question. Okay, that is a different problem. Okay, so, but not for data engineers. This point convinced you a lot. Oh my God, what happened? Oh, you're falling for my content. Oh my God, so sweet of you. Let's get into the next topic. So Spark is actually a framework. So first of all, we need to know what is framework in first place. So I'm just going to show you an example before we get into it. Just imagine you are living in an apartment where the apartment gives you a lot of amenities, right? Swimming pool, gym, bicycle, parking, and then camera, security, so many other stuff. And even you will be having electrician plumber inside the community itself, right? So now as a resident, I'll be just living peacefully so that the rest all the environmental aspect has been already provided by my apartment. So same way, if you take framework like Spark, you just need to concentrate only on the coding and the logic. The rest all stuff will be taken care by Spark. So there are so many other hurdles we will be getting as part of the developer, right? So, so many hurdles have been taken care by the Spark itself. So you don't want to worry about anything. And the Spark is completely free and it is open source. So Spark is a framework, okay? So you just get into that framework, just concentrate only to develop your machine learning model. That's it. You don't want to worry about any other environmental issues. Okay, let me tell you some of the environmental aspect of support that Spark gives to you. Okay, the first one. So just imagine you have the Python code and you want that code, the job what you have written, for example, linear regression. You wanted that job to run in parallel on multiple nodes which have the data. So on the on the end, it has to run in parallel processing. It should not run on a single thread. It should be running on a parallel thread so that the job will get faster. Now imagine if you are not using framework like Spark, so here you have to take care of this multi-threading. Then you have to write a separate code for doing this multi-threading stuff, right? So Spark is taking care of it. So you just you just submit your job. Don't worry about multi-threading. It internally split that as a task and runs on multiple nodes at the same time in a parallel way. Even in the single node, if two tasks get assigned, it will run in parallel. And we have control over it. You can even change it, actually. So Spark is actually a distributed environment. Now imagine you have your machine learning model with you. You have written it in Python code and you have to run this model in a distributed environment, right? So because you cannot run all your machine learning model in one mission, you cannot load, you cannot give a pressure for the particular mission, right? So imagine Spark helps you to distribute the data, which is actually going to act as an input data for your machine learning model. And not only the data, on top of the data that get distributed, Spark actually distributes the task. Now imagine you have written a Python machine learning code for linear regression. Now what Spark will do, it just take that linear regression Python job and it splits that into multiple tasks to achieve parallel processing. So we call it as MPP. So Spark supports MPP, which is nothing but massive parallel processing. Spark distributes the data and it distributes your job into tasks. Now these tasks parallelly runs on multiple mission which has your data that got distributed already. So Spark support four languages. So Spark can understand four languages, English, Tamil, Hindi, and German. Okay, so it's not that language. So Spark can able to understand four programming languages, Python, Scala, 
Java and R. So it supports Python and R, right? So for data scientists, it's, it's the biggest thing, right? So you do everything in Python, so Spark supports Python. So we call it as PySpark. So only for Python and Spark, we call it as a PySpark, but for other languages, we just don't have some such names. So only for Python Spark, we do call it as PySpark. So where it has this emulator, which I told you already, machine learning libraries that enables you to do all machine learning stuff with Spark. So, and that means you can able to get your Python port into the Spark and you can distribute the workloads and you can achieve massive parallel processing. Now, point number three. So you may get a question now. So you said the data is going to be get distributed, right? So imagine I have like 10 records and this 10 records has been got distributed across five nodes. Each node or a mission has two records. Now imagine all of a sudden this particular node got failed and what happened to the two records which got stored over there, right? So it's, there is no use, right? You have eight records and two records are zeros and there is no use, right? And imagine on top of these five nodes, the Spark linear regression job is running as five tasks. Now imagine four tasks has been already completed and these four tasks is waiting for the fifth task to get complete. But unfortunately, that fifth node has gone down and the data is also gone and the task which is running on top of the node is also gone. Now what happened to this four completed tasks? No use. Spark will have to kill all these complete tasks and it will kill the complete job. Now, it's all about the waste, right? Right. So Spark wasted the time of the effort of the developer and also it utilized the lot of RAM and hard disk, network resources, all waste, right? So how the fault tolerant mechanism works in Spark? Now let's get into it. Spark supports the fault tolerant mechanism where when you distribute the data with the help of an external distributed file system or with the help of Spark in memory concept, Spark can able to create replication for your data. Okay, what is mean by replication? Creating copies for the data. So imagine I have 10 records as a file and that file has been get split into five small chunks each with two records and these five chunks will be get replicated. So that means you have five chunks and you will be having two more copies of this five chunks and totally there is going to be 15 chunks because we need this fault tolerance. After this replication, now imagine your last task is running on top of a node and that node got failed. Now what Spark will do, instead of killing the whole job, it just killed that particular task only and then Spark will reassign that particular task to the second replica so that your job will not be get killed. No resources are wasted here. So Spark has the concept of fault tolerance. Now, if you are not using Spark Click framework, then you have to take care of monitoring the mission, the hence status, whether the mission is up and running or not. So you have to write a network programming. Or if the mission is goes down, if the node is failed, and you have to write another code to restart the task in a different node which has the replica. Right? So now Spark is taking care of all this. Right? You just concentrate on the code, just submit it. That's it. A next point. Even now, I do have a machine learning model, which I have completely written in thousand lines of codes in my Python. So when I migrate this to Spark Python, so do I need some kind of syntax changes over here? Of course, yes. So even at Spark, Spark has its own Python machine learning libraries. So there will be some sort of small syntax changes migration is required. So that you can log it, developer effort, and you can continue doing this migration because this is not an Apple to Apple migration, right? So whenever you bring something and you are just interested in a new framework and you have to make sure that your existing code can fit into this new framework or else you have to do some kind of code changes, but that is only, always there. Fine, the most important point with respect to Spark, you go and ask to any data engineer, what is Spark? And the first thing they used to say, Spark has in-memory processing. And now, what is this in-memory processing? See, you have, you've been getting some questions from your friend, right? And you have the answers in the memory and immediately you can respond to him because everything is there in your memory. But what happened if there's someone who is coming and asking you some question and it is not there in your mind, but you have written that in a notebook and what you will do? You will ask your friend, hey, just hold on a minute. It's not there in my memory. Let me just check my book. And at the book, you will be reading the content and you will be telling it to your friend, which takes a lot of time and it has a separate disk IO. So Spark has the capability to process your data in two modes. Either it could be in memory or it can be a disk. And the third mode is it can even do both. For example, you are getting a question from a friend and you have half an answer in your memory and half an answer in a notebook. So first half answer, you will be giving it in very speed and the second part will be in your notebook and you may take some time to explain that, right? So Spark can do the data processing in memory or in a disk or even in memory and disk at the same time. So this is a wonderful advantage where Spark is faster than any other existing framework in our big data world. 
and Spark is able to support two types of processing. It could be a batch processing or a stream processing. Now imagine your machine learning model is running on a file which is already there, which is a batch processing. Or you are just capturing some event from a website or a mobile app and the live data is coming. So Spark has a capability to run your machine learning algorithm on and on a streaming data as a streaming job. And that is a very big advantage as we have in Spark. And what is the next advantage of Spark? This is also an interesting factor. Spark has the concept of lineage, data lineage. Imagine you are writing a lot of transformations, like transformation one, transformation two, transformation three. Now Spark has maintained the complete lineage of your code, of your transformation. At any point of time, you can able to backtrack your previous transformation or even before that, and you can again rerun your models from the beginning or from the mid. So because Spark maintains the lineage, of the system and the data and the processing. And the last point is Spark supports lazy evaluation. So you even have this concept in Python as well. What does it mean by lazy evaluation? So Spark main syntax splits into two, transformation and action. So we do have some sort of functions and keywords for transformations to transforming the data. And we do have some syntaxes and function call it as an action just to Make sure that you are invoking an action. For example, you are writing some hundred lines of transformation and finally you are not printing it or finally you are not writing to a file and printing it, this writing to a file is all considered to be an action. Now I do a filter, I do a group by, I do a sum, I do some sort of aggregation, uppercase, lowercase. So these are considered to be a transformation, a join. So now you have like hundred lines of code and you have written so many transformation and finally you are not even printing that. Then what is the use of Spark to execute all this hundred lines? It uses the network, it uses the disk, it uses the RAM and finally is not printing the output or writing the output. Then it is waste of resource, right? So we have something called a lazy evaluation. Even though you have hundred lines of code, at end of the code, you have to definitely call an action. Only when there is an action available in the code, the Spark will run all your transformation from bottom to top. So we call it as a lazy evaluation. So these are all the some important points which can impress you to get to know what's Spark in detail. So I have a complete Big Data Spark video playlist in my description box of this video. Just go and click it and you will be getting the complete list of Spark videos. So as I told you, as a data scientist and machine learning engineer, you should know Spark or any Big Data components for some aspect of skill set that you should have because people are expecting that from you. If you really like this video, please do subscribe my channel and forward this to your friends and colleagues and thanks for watching.